we'll continue our studying here that we continued last week from about six months ago, or three months ago, I guess now, on making Christianity attractive. I do have a few extra sheets of tonight's study. If you are new and didn't get one previously, you're welcome to one. If you've got one at home that you didn't find, uh, you can have an extra copy, I guess, uh, without costing you too much. Be turning in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's where we left off in our study last week, and we'll pick up at that point in our study this evening. continue to think about the serious responsibility that we as children of God have, we remember who it is that we represent. And thus we live our lives in such a way as to hopefully generate an interest in the minds of others to have what we have as New Testament Christians. If they do not see anything in us different than what they see in the rest of the world, then they will have no interest in what we have because they already have it. But God's people are to be a different people. Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you, be a father unto you, you can be my sons and daughters. Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 6. And so the Christian is to live a life separate from the ways of the world. That's why John said in 1 John 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And I forgot to turn that on, Brian, if you're trying to figure out why it's not working. Is it on? Okay, okay. And so we are to be separate, different from the ways of the world. And so as we do that, we try to make Christianity attractive. And we're not trying to present to the world a picture of something that the world can enjoy in its worldly ways. But what we're trying to offer is an option, an alternative, a better way to live than the way the world lives. So we've been looking at a number of different things that will help us make Christianity attractive. And in our study last week, we began to look at the point uh, generosity versus greed. We mentioned a number of verses, beginning with Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 and following, Jesus taught us to not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, that is the necessities of life that he just got to talking about. All these things shall be added unto you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, we are encouraged to be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men shall do unto me. So all of these verses indicate to us that we are not to succumb to the materialistic attitude that prevails in our world. But rather we are to seek those things which are spiritual. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Then he tells us in verses 5 through 9 of that chapter, Colossians 3, things that are to be put off. 
Beginning in verse 10, he tells us things that are to be put on, that makes a difference, that makes us something that the world is not. It makes us, it enables us to have something that the world does not have. And that ought to be the picture that we're trying to present to the world. We have something that the world doesn't have that the world should want within us. I'm convinced that there are a lot of people in the world who really would like to be better people. But in some cases, they just maybe don't know how. They've not had the right example. They've not had the right encouragement. I've heard people, even in the church, talking about other members of the church, make a comment to the effect, Man, I wish, I, I wish my life was like theirs. I wish I could have the attitude that they have. I, I wish I could do the things that they do. Well, <clears throat> what is keeping us from that? If we have that desire, and if we have the ability, then we're the only thing that's keeping us from being what we want to be. There are a lot of people in the world like that. They see us living the Christian life. While their lifestyle may not comply with ours, yet they still deep down inside are saying, man, I wish I could live like that. That's the kind of picture we want to present. And so involved in that is a people of generosity. Generosity. Should be nobody more generous than those who are God's people. We began in the closing part of our study last week reading through the first few verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we noted in that regard that there is a key word that appears several times within those first several verses. Who remembers what the word is? Grace. Grace. How often do we connect giving with grace? And yet in this context, that is exactly what Paul does. And so, of course, we began by talking about the fact that generosity is demonstrated by whom to the greatest degree? By God Himself. You'll notice in, in verse 1, uh, Brethren, we do you to wit or know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. God had given to the churches of Macedonia. And later on, He'll... He'll discuss what that is. Uh, in verse 2, he talks about their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. While they were poor in a material sense, God had enabled them to be rich in a spiritual sense. That is a great lesson that our world needs tonight. Far too many people want to talk about riches only in terms of the material. Then you come down to verse 6. Uh, he talks about the work that had, had begun, uh, uh, that he wants to be uh, finished, and he refers to it as a grace. What is this work that Paul is desiring now to be finished in Corinth? All right, there is a financial need, and brethren have been asked to help supply this need. And so uh, within uh, this context, uh, it suggests that uh, it had been in the making in Corinth for how long? About a year, hadn't it? And it's time to finish it now. But you'll notice he refers to it as this grace also. So there the word grace is used. And, and so in this connection, God has been very gracious and He has been very generous to the brethren of Macedonia. You'll notice in verse 5, He says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So where does it begin? If we're going to be a generous people, where does it begin? Giving ourselves to the Lord. 
If we give ourselves to the Lord, what does He have? Everything that we have. It's His. And we understand it in that regard. The Bible uses the word steward. And we often talk about the responsibility of stewardship. What do we have that really belongs to us? Absolutely nothing. It has been a blessing from God, everything that we have. We are but stewards of it. We are to use it wisely. And there are parables to that end. And one day we'll be called into account as to how we have used the richness of God's grace toward us. And one of the ways that we respond to God's grace is in our generosity to others. What has He given for us? Our Lord gave His life. God gave His only begotten Son. Of course, we think of those maybe as the ultimate gifts. But what else do we enjoy in this life as a result of being children of God? Every spiritual blessing that is available in Christ is available to us. We are rich in Christ. God has been more than generous with us. So that ought to encourage us to be a generous people as well. So generosity as initiated by the Lord. Then you notice in verses 3 and 4 that generosity is from the heart, not by force. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. That's an indication of their generosity. They were willing of themselves. Nobody's forcing them to do it. I don't want to read too much into what Paul says in this connection. But when he talks about their giving beyond their power, that little phrase, then the, the phrase, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, is there anything that, that strikes a chord with you when you read those two little phrases? I was going to say the King James does say <laughs> that. I was looking back in mind to see where I missed that word. All right. Does does it does it even sound remotely like Paul might have been a little bit reluctant to take the gift that they were offering, at least the amount of the gift, in view of their deep poverty? What is the word entreaty? Praying us with much entreaty. They were begging us to take it. I don't know that Paul was trying to say to those brethren, now folks, you know, y'all are so poor and, and whatever. That, that's, that's just, you know, that's an awful lot for you. Know, I don't say for a minute that Paul is saying that, but, but there's just something about the wording of this that makes me think of that when I read it. It was beyond their ability to give. He, they were begging Him to take it. I wonder what elders of the Lord's church would do today if they had a congregation of people like that. Come on, elders, take this money. There's so much good work out there. I know you all get requests. Come on, please take this money. Well, that might create some heart problems. They wouldn't know how to deal with it. But that's what we have here. That's the example of generosity that is expressed relative to the church at Macedonia. They took the initiative in wanting to help. They were not forced. Paul wasn't begging them. They were begging Paul. There's the degree of generosity. Gave more than, than was expected. Then you'll notice as well 
in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, combining these two chapters here, and we'll look at several sections within these two chapters, but, but some of the principles of generosity. And I think these are interesting for us to know because we're God's people. God has been so generous to us. We have been blessed beyond measure. How generous are we? Look at some of the principles involved in this regard. In chapter 8, in verses 7 and 8, we notice the principle that genuine love produces genuine giving. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, he has used the Macedonians as an example of a generous congregation. Now he's back to them, back to the church at Corinth. So he says, I'm not... You know, I'm, I'm not speaking by commandment here, but by occasion, because of the occasion. Tie in with that Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. What does Paul say? As ye have therefore opportunity. Well, how does that fit right here? Here was an opportunity. Here are some brethren who were in need. And obviously the Corinthian brethren were able in part to supply that need. So he's saying, here's what real love is all about. It takes advantage of opportunities to do good. That's what he teaches in Galatians chapter 6. And so that, uh, that principle of love, gener genuine love produces genuine giving. What will most parents give to see that their children succeed? Huh? What will they give? Everything they have and then some. They'll borrow, not literally, but the old expression, they'll borrow big and steal. Now hopefully they won't steal. But parents will do everything within their ability and then some sometimes, to see that their children succeed in life. Why? They want their children to have it better than they had it. But what's the root motivation here? They love those children. And because of their love for those children, they want them to succeed. They don't want them to be a failure in life. So out of that genuine love, for those children, there's genuine generosity to try to help them succeed in life. What about if we really love God? If we really love Christ? If we really love the church? How will we respond in this regard? Just give the leftovers? Is that an expression of genuine love? Absolutely not. It's a, it's, a, it's a display of selfishness is what it is. It's not a display of genuine love. We want something bad enough, we can usually figure out a way to buy it, can't we? We'll sacrifice to have the material things that we want in this life. How much sacrifice do we make in order to see that the cause of Christ can be a greater success in this world. How generous is our giving in that regard? Is that the way we plan our giving? Because of our genuine love for the church and the work that the church is doing, and we want so desperately to be as much a part of that as we possibly can. Is that the way we decide what we're going to give? 
Or do we look at all of our other bills that we've generated because of all of our wants and desires of material things and see what we've got left and see how much of that we might be willing to turn loose on? How do we decide what we're going to give monetarily to the work of the Lord? Well, here's one of the principles that's involved in generosity. It is from the heart. It is out of genuine love that we do what we do for the cause of Christ. Then in verses 10, or rather, yeah, verses 10 and 11, another principle of generosity is that generosity is desire fulfilled in action. Look at verses 10 and 11. Herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before, not only to do, but yea, also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. How many times have you heard the expression, the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. There's a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. So a year ago, from the time of Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he said you were willing to participate. Obviously they had expressed a desire to participate. But for whatever reason, at this point, there had not been the performance, a fulfillment of that desire, whether this is the appropriate time to do it, whether they had procrastinated. I don't know the real uh, bottom line of that scenario right here. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, he says, you are willing, now what? Do it. Perform. Put it in action. You've probably had occasions in your life where you said, man, I'm, I meant to do that. I fully intended to do that. I would never ask for a show of hands because I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody. You all know me better than that. Don't look at me like that. But if I were to ask and you were willing to answer... <laughs> How many of you would I have to say, man, I fully intended to bring something for that Rain Tree Village food truck that was coming through here. Now, a lot of you performed. And there was a pile of stuff that they picked up this morning. There was a pile of stuff. But there may be some of us that fully intended, but never did perform. Well, when it comes to other matters, whether it's benevolence, whether it's visiting, giving of our time, whether it is rearranging our finances so we can contribute more to the work of the Lord, how many people have said that? You know, I really intended this year to get my finances in better shape, rearrange, reprioritize, whatever, so I could contribute more to the cause of Christ and, and contribute less to myself. That would be a good intention, wouldn't it? But what about the performance of it? The intention is not going to benefit the Lord's church. The performance will. And so, so there is another principle involved in that regard. Then in chapter 8 and verse 12, you notice he says, For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to the man hath, and not according to the hath not. Then in verse or chapter 9, in verses 1 through 5, he said, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. 
Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say, uh, that we say not ye, should be ashamed the same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make you beforehand, make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not as a matter of covetousness. Now that last little phrase, not as a matter of covetousness. So when you go back to chapter 8 and in verse 12, what does he talk about? It's, it's accepted if there is what? A willing mind. So generosity is evaluated on the basis of willingness. On the basis of willingness. How many of you Consider that you are generous toward Uncle Sam. None of you? I, I feel like I'm very generous. Every quarter, I feel like I'm very generous with you. Of a willing man? Mm-mm. No. But to the Lord. Is it possible that some brethren have the same attitude in their giving to the cause of Christ that they have in giving to Uncle Sam? I don't really want to. I tell you, we could, we could do a lot with this money, but I guess, you know, since we're commanded to do it, I guess I better do it. That's the same attitude, and it's not of a willing mind. It's not acceptable. And you see, that's the very principle that, that Paul is setting forth in this context. Generosity comes out of a willing mind. We're not going to be generous if we don't have a willing mind. We'll be as stingy as all get out. But when we start evaluating, it needs to be on the basis of, of our willingness. It is accepted according to the man hath, not according to that he hath not. God has never expected of anyone that they do not have. Never. Parable of the talents. Five talent, two talent, one talent. Did God expect the two talent man to produce five talents? No. No, he didn't expect that. Neither did he expect the five talent man to be satisfied with two. According to the half. And then that old question comes up you know, we are to give as we have been prospered. Suppose the Lord prospered us according to our giving. Would we be richer or poorer if He gave according to us as we give to Him? If He prospered us based on our giving to Him. Interesting observations, to say the least. So it's not what we have or don't have. In the Philippian letter, in uh, chapter 4, and in verse 11, Paul says of himself, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. You know, sometimes I think we get confused with this idea of being content and get the idea that what Paul is saying is that, that whatever it is that we have, we should not desire or want any more than that. That's not what the word content suggests. The idea is that we do not allow the desire to accumulate more wealth, riches, material things to the point that that becomes our God. There's nothing wrong with bettering oneself. The better off we are, 
the more generous we can be, the more people we can help, the more we can give to the cause of Christ. So as long as we use it wisely, there's absolutely nothing wrong with gaining more. So the word content doesn't suggest to be satisfied to the point that we don't try to do any better. But doing better does not become our God. Doing better does not become so a part of us that we let that direct our lives and guide our thinking rather than the Lord and His will. That's the idea of being content as suggested in these verses. Then you come down to Verses 13, 14, 15, you have another principle of generosity. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for you, your want, that there may be equality. What's his point? You have it. They don't. Suppose the shoe were on the other foot. Suppose they had it and you didn't. What would you want them to do relative to you? Ignore you? Tell you got yourself in this mess, you figure out how to get out of it? Is that the way you'd want them to treat you? Well, no. So he says, you apply here that golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, beginning, well, especially verse 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Why? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What's his point? Golden rule. Here's a brother who's been tempted. Here's a brother who's been overtaken in a fault. Put yourself in his shoes. How would you want him to treat you if you were in his shoes? It's his problem. He got himself into that mess. He knows better than to do that kind of thing. Let him deal with it. Is that the way you want to be treated when you're overcome of temptation? Why, no. I wouldn't want to be treated that way. I would want somebody to come to me and say, Sidney, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm saddened by what's happened to you. What can I do to help? What can I do to get you back up and get going on that right track again? Let me help you. Well, if that's, you know, if that's what we would want folks to do for us, then shouldn't we be doing that for them? As we often say, not kicking people while they're down. That's when they need us to help pick them up, when they're down. And so that's the principle that he's dealing with here in generosity. You have it, they don't. The shoe were on the other foot. Think about what you'd want. Now you act like that. That principle of the golden rule. Then there's another principle involved in chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7. But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. So what's the principle? You sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. You have the same principle in Galatians chapter 6, in verses uh, 7 and 8. And it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, there's a different point in these verses, but the same principle is there. You're going to reap what you sow. So if we sow sparingly, we can expect to reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we can expect to reap bountifully. 
farmer who decides that the crop that he produced this year is not sufficient, so he wants a bigger, better crop next year, what are some of his alternatives? Well, he can rent an extra hundred, five hundred, thousand acres, depending on what he's doing. Plant bigger, plant a bigger farm. Put more seed in the ground. Maybe do a little better job fertilizing. A lot of opportunities where he can have a better uh, year of production. But suppose he just says, well, I don't care. Didn't do very well this year. Don't care if I don't do anything next year. What's he going to probably do next year? Nothing or less. Certainly no better. And so then you go back to Matthew chapter 25. And in verse um, 23, swear and this is just one of a couple of verses but man with the two talents his Lord said unto him well done good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things I will make thee ruler over many things so he's done well with that which has been entrusted to him so he's going to be given bigger and better he's going to have a stewardship over more things what does Malachi say to the people of his day and well, God through Malachi? Malachi chapter 3 and about verse 10. Who remembers that when God had said, Will a man rob God? You've robbed me. But what does God, how does God challenge those people? You bring your tithes into the storehouse, and what's going to happen? The windows of heaven will be open. And you'll have more than you can handle. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? He that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. If we believe that, it'll produce generosity, won't it? Generosity is possible because we have been so richly blessed Chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He that he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. What is God able to supply? No limit to it, is it? I think about Paul's statement in Ephesians chapter, latter part of chapter 3. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. What's God able to do? Beyond anything we can imagine or think. So when we think about making Christianity attractive, what should people see in us? A people who are ready and willing to give where there's a need, to supply the needs that, that, that come to us, to take advantage of opportunities that are ours to do good. I think I could safely say that this congregation is probably above average in that regard. Whenever there is a need and you're encouraged, you usually supply that need. I mean, the food items were just, a, just an example of that. But we have a lot of opportunities. The elders will tell you in a moment's time 
how many good opportunities, how many good requests we get on a regular basis to help others preaching the gospel. To whom they have to reply, I'm sorry, but our budget's full. Wouldn't it be nice if we would recognize these principles, principles of generosity, get our priorities in order, get self out of the way, get the Lord in His proper place with the funds that we have, become greater givers, more generous givers. And then when the elders began to work up future budgets, they would sit with astonishment. I can't believe. We've got this much money to try to spend. Wouldn't that be a nice problem? Be a nice problem. My guess is that if we all would re examine, refigure, reestablish priorities, that we could all probably do some better. To what degree, I don't know. That's not for me to say. But if we want to make Christianity attractive, Let's show people by our generosity, whether it's in, in the giving of our money, in the giving of our time, in the use of our talents, whatever it might be, let people see in us a people that are really committed to the cause of Christ and encourage them to desire what we have in that regard. Now, Lord willing, next uh, Wednesday evening, uh, we'll pick up right there with the very next point. How well do we honor God? That'll be our study next Wednesday evening.